Today, I'm talking with Natalie Rachel. She is a behavioral economist and studies burnout, working with individuals and organizations, helping to unpack some of the mysteries around what's disconnected and why are so many people feeling so off about work. Welcome to the podcast, Natalie. Thanks, Paul. Thank you very much for inviting me. So I know you don't want to dwell too much on your own uh, story, but I thought it'd be a good place to start. Just uh, so you were headed in a very academic path. And um, I'd love to hear where you were on that path and where you were headed when things started going off course for you. Yeah, certainly. I mean, so that's absolutely right. So I've been very much on the kind of academic, um, cliche, high achiever, like, you know, went to Oxford, did philosophy, politics, economics, it's quite a high pressure, prestigious degree in the in the UK. Um, you know, didn't really have any problems with that, kind of at least superficially was enjoying it, went straight on to you know, a master's in economics and was all headed for a kind of academic career. Um, But really, I think I hadn't stopped even since school to do any kind of introspection on whether, you know, whether I was actually happy. I hadn't really considered any alternative, uh, never mind career paths, I hadn't even considered any alternative ways of of living and kind of organising my time. Um, And then found myself in couple of years into a PhD program I finished my master's ended up doing a science of PhD program um and they realized I was actually really struggling to motivate myself it was much more self-directed the PhD study than the undergraduate degree or even the master's degree which was mainly taught um and and actually found that the, I was kind of drawing on reserves that just weren't there to to complete the work that I had for the day um didn't really like that feeling didn't you know didn't really give me a very good feeling about myself and kind of where, where I was heading and so on. Um, but pushed on because I did partly because I didn't really know anything else, partly because I, I guess wanted to avoid the awkward conversations with my supervisor and my parents and my friends and so on. Um, but then ended up actually catching meningitis. Um, and possibly I think you could make the, make the case that, that it was because I was so run down with the constant repressed chronic stress. Uh, that's possibly how I managed to catch that um, and ended up going, going blind uh, to, to cut a long story short. I um, you got really severely ill with, with the meningitis and, and lost my eyesight for completely lost it for a year. And then it kind of started to come back gradually over the course of, kind of two years so to, to a point where I could kind of see enough to, you know, to, to read slowly and so on. I mean, it's still not completely back. I thought, you know, I still can't drive. I still want quite poor peripheral vision, but it's, um, you know, I can, I can see you <laughs> now on the, on the camera, which is good. That's pretty profound. Uh, I'd love to hear what were some of the scripts you grew up with? I, I mean, for me, it was, I look back and it's almost a little night in, it's a little funny how naive I was about the world. It's just like, I had these ideas like do good in school, get a job and then something. Yeah. I didn't really know what it was. What, what were the scripts for you? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting. I, it was, it felt like autopilot. And I know that kind of sounds like I'm pushing responsibility on someone else for not writing my own script. Like, you know, and part of me was was actually angry with myself for a while because you know I actually didn't have super pushy parents like they're they're both quite academic um and I guess I was following them in in that sense but I can't sort of say like some people have that their parents you know were kind of very putting up pressure on them and like you know fearing the the shame of it and things like that my parents have always actually been very loving and supportive and laid back it was more kind of failure of my own exploration the fact that I I guess in some ways I was fortunate in that I didn't struggle academically. So I just kind of kept going on that path without ever really questioning it and without bumping into any sort of resistance. It just felt like, oh, this is what I'm good at. This is what I like. I get praise for doing this. This is what people I get on with also do. Um, so it was more just a kind of self neglect really of, of reflection one thing I've realized is that you're, if you're on a path in which 
other people see as kind of a default path or a successful path, no one will ever ask you, why are you doing What are you doing? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and I I only realized this after leaving the path in which people ask me all the time now, why are you doing this? What's your goal? Don't you worry about this? <laughs> and you realize when you're off these default paths, you worry about these questions all the time. But when I was like, quote unquote, successful on paper, I didn't even think about these things. And nobody yeah. questioned me about it. It's like, oh, you got a promotion? Awesome. Great job. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly right. Yeah. And it's, it's, you know, it's until you kind of run up into these like problems. Like for me, it was kind of my first intimation that maybe something was wrong was when I was really struggling to motivate myself. Um, but then really, I think I, pro- I could have pushed through had it not been for the health crisis. Um, I, you know, I could easily have got through just on, on brute force willpower. And now we'll probably be, you know, halfway through some sort of mediocre academic <laughs> career. Yeah. Well, I think that's the thing too, is the demands of the type of paths that you were on, you couldn't act, you probably couldn't even have done it, right? Your body was Mm -hmm. literally saying you're done. Exactly. (laughs) You're stopping here, right? (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. Except we're, we're still kind of going along these scripts. What did you ever, did you have a concept of burnout at the time? I didn't actually. No, I mean, it, I mean, this was quite a while ago now. Anyway, kind of 2010 and um, 12 kind of thing. But um, no, I, I really, I really didn't. Certainly not in those terms. Um, I mean, I think if I maybe talked to someone about it, they might have suggested I was maybe getting depressed or something like that. But I, yeah. I really didn't um, have any kind of concept of burnout. And if I did, I think I would have associated it more with kind of Silicon Valley executives rather than you know. <laughs> mild English academics who were just kind of repressing themselves. Yeah. I think that was one of the blind spots for me too. I I pictured burnout as basically working a ton of hours and I didn't work a lot of hours. So in my mind, it was like, well, I, it was just something I never thought of, but I think since going through my own burnout experience and talking to so many other people about work, I realized there's kind of three buckets and I'd be interested to know if you agree with these three buckets. So one is like pure exhaustion, right? And if the eye banker is working 90 hours for a couple of years, it's Mm -hmm. pretty predictable. And they are, they're also like some of the most self-aware, but I think the second and third categories, the second one is basically a disconnect from who you want to be and where you're at. Like you kind of have this picture of like where, kind of person you want to be or a path you were on. And there's a disconnect from that. And then you, you kind of feel stuck. Uh, this one's a little harder to, um, figure out. And then the third one is really extended periods of doing stuff. You're not actually motivated to do, which I think is one of the trickiest ones because in organizations, uh, it's basically designed around motivating you to do things you don't want to do. So you can kind of do things you're four out of 10 or six out of 10 or five out of 10 excited about for years uh, Mm -hmm. until you recognize, oh my God, I haven't been excited about anything I've worked on for 10 years. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, that makes perfect sense to me. I mean, like when I speak to people about their burnout, what's what they've always got in common is some kind of, they've had to suppress and just everything's got pushed down. So they're in this kind of permanent state of depletion and suppression and, and all of their feelings and emotions are quite flattened um and you know that certainly makes sense with buckets two and three um I mean I think with exhaustion it's certainly linked um but it doesn't ha- it doesn't have to be I mean with with I guess you what you could call just straight exhaustion simple exhaustion like if after you've run a marathon or just been working really really hard at something that tends to come with a sense of satisfaction and can be addressed with rest and you know nourishment right. and just and just kind of getting back to getting back to a regular routine whereas with whereas with burnout rest doesn't touch it um there's no sense of satisfaction there's no sense of ever the task ever being completed um and as you say with with the other two buckets it is it's kind of it is a, a fundamental disconnect where you're having to where you're conscious of there being something else within you if, if you want to think of it in those terms but you're having to push it down and push it down um 
and push yourself on regardless. And then the symptoms of burnout, kind of physical, cognitive, emotional, I think of what happens, uh, it's what a human experience is when they've, when they're, everything is saying no, but is being ignored and just pushed on regardless, so, you know, something will let you know that, you can't, that you've got to stop. Obviously, in my case, it was quite dramatic, but, it, you know, it can just be noticing noticing changes in your in your emotional patterns and the way you're behaving with with family and stuff yeah and the first one too the exhaustion Mm. the the original i think the original work done on burnout was done in the 1970s at least from an academic standpoint and they were looking at Mm. healthcare workers and Mm. that was a very caring profession right so a lot of emotional labor And I think in a sense, a lot of knowledge work now has huge amounts of emotional labor as well. Um, Mm -hmm. So we, we have a hard time of saying, oh, there's actually all this, this work I'm doing in my last job. I was basically just spending all my mental energy predicting how to not um, upset a very important senior person. Right. Right. So trying to predict, predict their emotions, predict their swings, predict their reactions, try to like, (laughs) and over time, like this is incredibly exhausting. And in my case, I, I started becoming resentful and basically an unlikable version of myself. And that's when I had to like step back and say, who the hell am I? Why am I behaving this way? I don't actually care about these things. Um, and I think that's one of the tricky things too, is you can kind of self-destruct um, because you are not, um, you're just not in control anymore. Mm. But yeah. I mean, that makes perfect sense. And, you know, I guess if you're managing someone else's emotions, um, you're not being authentic to yourself. And, you know, over a period of time, that's, that's devastating. If you're like constantly having to suppress that authenticity and, you know, to make that bargain with not upsetting their you know, the the senior manager. Um, Yeah. And that's a hard thing too. We have this idea of be your full self at work, Mm -hmm. which is equally as tricky. And (laughs) I I think sets people up for failure just as much. Mm -hmm. Uh, How do you see that play out in the the, kind of the disconnect between um, be your, be your full self at work? Um, and also kind of succeed at work and don't burn out in all these things. It's a tricky one. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I think that the, there are, it's, we, our relationship with work is quite dysfunctional <laughs> in a lot of ways. Um, so I, I, some people say to me that, you know, they don't really want to bring their full self to work. What they right. want is a separation. They actually want to go to work, fulfill what needs to be done. And then forget about it. They're not interested in being their full self. They don't want their work to be their spouse, their, you know, their parent, their lover. Like what they just kind of want to do their job and forget about it. Um, but then there's also this other sort of parallel argument that people suffer when they have to, when they do have to repress their, their full self at work, um, whether that's constantly watching what they say or um having to prioritize things that really don't matter to them at all. Um so, so the, I, I, it's a good question because I, I don't really know where those parallel tracks meet. Um, but certainly, there does seem to be something kind of unhealthy in that work work relationship. Yeah, the, and I think part of it is a lot of our work has become abstracted from yeah. who we are. So, what we're actually working on is, say, we're putting together a report that's like dealing with metrics outside of our control, reporting on something else, reporting to another person and coordinating something that's halfway across the world. Um, We're not really connected to that. Um, Mm -hmm. So then at the same time, we're in a very outer mode while trying to be very inner and saying we're trying to be our best selves at work. So we have this conflict. Um, It's really hard to grapple with. And I think one thing I heard you say in another podcast is how a lot of people get um, like maybe younger people now say they're a little too narcissistic, but I'm, I'm not sure that's right. It's almost like people aren't reflecting at all. Like we were talking about at the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. It's a very surface level um, inner world. Yeah. 
because exactly. of how abstracted yeah. everything is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, it's like it's a kind of self obsession, but it's but it's but no knowledge comes from it. There's, there's, it's like obsession without curiosity, which is painful because you you you're kind of isolated by this excessive self regard and like you're trying to protect your ego and trying to make everything meaningful we've kind of got this idea that work ought to be meaningful for for some reason um but you're not actually on a journey where you're getting to know yourself and your priorities any better um maybe because we're, we're sometimes scared of what, what what we'll find and what we'll have to do as a result of that exploration yeah i i think it is scary for people mm -hmm. i think what i realized in talking to people about work in their relationship, you probably find this, is that if you're really honest in some of these questions, you might risk basically blowing up your life. Right. Because if you if you follow the answers that are true to what you uh, think about yourself, uh, it might not be good for you financially or for stability-wise um, or things like that. How do you handle that when you're talking to people about burnout? It's definitely, I mean, that's definitely at the core of, of what people are trying to deflect from, I think, when they avoid getting to that route. Um, I know Schopenhauer wrote about force of habit seems like it's coming from the authentic self, but it's actually a way of protecting us from the kind of, or protecting the will and the intellect from the danger and the work of actually genuinely making a fresh choice because it is dangerous. Like you say, you know, we risk social status and relationships um economic risk um you know and, and just psychological risk of, of making a, a genuinely fresh choice and then there's also that it's incredibly painful to realize that you've been on the wrong path for however long and um, and that takes a period of, of grieving sometimes kind of anger at yourself um because ultimately you you've to a greater or lesser degree got yourself into that situation um, so there is a lot of resistance to get through. Um, but when I'm, you know, when I'm working with clients and talking to talking to people, it's that getting to the root is a necessary first step. Um, so I think that's that's kind of the first thing to recognize is that it's, it's not pleasant, but it is the only way. Um, superficial responses to burnout rarely have any impact at all and can actually end up being even more demoralizing because you kind of feel like, oh, this is, I've tried this and this is another thing that's failed and I'm just kind of still stuck where I, where I am. So I think you do have to get, get to the root of, of your burnout. And, and I mean, as, as you say, like re really go back to what, what is your core desire? Like, cause it's, it's something that we, do, I think is a chronically under, underdeveloped, neglected muscle in us. Like what is our, our genuine desire what, what matters to us what are our priorities what are our true strengths because I mean my you know, thinking of myself like when I was in that kind of academic career I don't really know that that was the best thing it was it was just it was just the kind of rails that I was on from school and I hadn't crashed into anything yet so right. you know it would have carried on indefinitely I guess yeah, I mean nobody's ever going to criticize or question somebody that's like going to Oxford, right? That's the thing. I mean, and I'm glad that I did. I mean, at that, up until that point, I think that I was actually engaged and enjoying my subject. But it was once it got to kind of career, and I realised that I was what 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 an academic career is is essentially zooming in on a smaller and smaller mm. area of study, and you 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 know obviously your expertise becomes deeper and deeper, but you're you're digging yourself further and further into that 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 world, and it, it was certainly a moment of panic. <laughs> Yeah, the the research I found, I, it's a guy Herbert uh, Frodenberger. Have you run right. across his research? Yeah. It's, it's yeah. like one of the one of the first um, papers written on this. But I was reading his quote earlier today, and he was saying, "If burnout comes as a consequence of a loss of an ideal, then you most certainly need sympathy and support." And the very motivation that lead you to come into an institution as a volunteer has been lost. And the burnout has also within it the dynamics of mourning. Right. So it's like you're all you're also like disconnecting from a story that helped you mm -hmm. make sense of your life. Yeah. Um and 
for me, I, I left my job, but I didn't have a story to reorient it. So the, Mm -hmm. the story I first attached to was a freelance consultant and it was very flimsy. Mm -hmm. Um, and it just took a really long time to, I still don't really have a story. Um, Mm -hmm. but yeah, it's, it's a really hard thing to navigate. How, how has like story and narrative played a role in your path? Um, I think that, yeah, I mean, that's such an interesting question. I mean, it's in, quite interesting to reflect how much we kind of make the choice we make just because we want to avoid someone asking us what we do and we don't want to <laughs> have a kind of confusing answer to it. Um, I mean, and, and I, I mean, for me, certainly it was, it was simpler when I was kind of on the academic path. Um, now, I mean, it kind of comes up less I suppose I one thing that I've noticed actually is people are more open to uh discussions about like uh you know fuller sort of portfolio of a career and what people's interests are and what they're passionate about rather than that sort of desperation just put people in in these narrow narrow categories um so I've you know I've tried not to for myself not really to be particularly um influenced by a, a, a story that adds up in, in a in a simple way um and try to try to kind of have conversations about more interesting things but um but it certainly is it is an, a huge inhibiting factor for people uh, when they want to change direction um but that, but that's such a prison like to to be in like just that right. kind of avoiding that awkwardness it's such a personal cost and i i think that's some evidence that things are getting better like the fact yeah. that more people are talking about burnout and more people are um, talking about it and overcoming it, previous generations just sucked it up and internalized yeah. that pain and basically made that pain permanent. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's really painful to see some people, I think, in previous generations who know, like, wow, there there was like a real cost there. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was the honorable thing to do. Um, right. And shifting now, so many more people, I think, have, I think work has gotten better, but people's expectations are actually higher. Exactly. Then work has gotten better. So it's this weird disconnect where it's, um, people just aren't accepting like years of being, uh, verbally abused or, Mm. um, (laughs) trying to please other people, uh, as much as they used to in the past. And, I think organizations are really struggling to adapt to this. Yes. Yeah. Especially the boomers. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, bless the boomers. Yeah, exactly. Um, Yeah. I mean, and I think people want more from their work now as well. I mean, they have, like you say, the expectations are so much higher um, and how we expect work to make us feel and like what, what we, what role we want it to play in our, in our life story. Um, That's, I think, changed from, from previous generations where possibly it was, not necessarily less important, but it was, um, you know, it, it, people were more satisfied, I guess, for it to have a simpler relationship. Yeah. I, th- I mean, I saw that change even from when I graduated and when I left the workforce, mm-hmm. I entered the workforce in 07 or probably 03 when I was interning, but I never had this idea that work should be meaningful. Right. The first time I had a different idea of what work could be, I saw graduating senior year, I saw Google is number one on the best places to work. And they just described like this playground. Um, it really was just an extension of college. But when I left in 2017, every young person I met entering the workforce was like, I want to do something I'm passionate about. I want to be happy about my work. And, uh, that's just really hard. Yeah. Yeah. It's incredibly hard. I mean, it's a lot to us for anything like, you know, even, even just for any aspect of life, it's, it's a lot to demand from it. And um, particularly if you've not spent the time um, to, you know, to really examine what it is that you want and how you are going to derive that meaning and purpose uh, from, from what you're doing. Yeah. Have you noticed any trends in certain types of professions or uh, backgrounds that 
end up the most disconnected. I think a couple I've noticed that keep reaching out to me are people who do social responsibility where like the reality is not matching what they're hoping for. Um, Mm. And then also just people who have this idea of impact. I need to have an impact in my career. Um, End up just really struggling to find it. Have you noticed any trends in terms of people's expectations or backgrounds? Yeah, certainly. I mean, and those two areas that you mentioned definitely chime with 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 what I've seen because it's it is it's it's in some ways it's the it's the mirror of what you mentioned about where you're spending a lot of time doing something that you deep down feel doesn't matter that can burn you out. But equally, it, you can be burned out when you actually you care a lot about what you're doing, but you just don't feel like you've got the resources, either financial or just kind of organisational, to actually do what what the job that you have in your mind requires you to do and I mean that was a big that's a big factor in physician burnout you know it's not that they don't care yeah. but it's it you know it's that they're that they they want to spend this extra time with patients or whatever but they but they either don't have, have the time because of the the other demands on them or they don't have the resources and that's a component of the psychological burnout um obviously as well as the kind of sleep deprivation and the long hours and all the rest of it but um but yeah, so so I think that whether whether a job's where a big factor in choosing that career path is that you you care very deeply, but for whatever reason you're kind of undermined by the organisation um, in actually achieving that. That's a big that's a big trend, and you know, incredibly psychologically painful for people. Um, also, I mean, burnout is pretty consistent among entrepreneurs. I think um, in the particularly in the kind of startup space as well, like where you're very closely identified with your company's mission, you, you sacrifice a lot um, in terms of sleep, relationships. Um, and again, like you say, it's very, very tightly linked with your self-image. You can't really separate your, you know, your, your company from yourself. It's almost an extension. So that obviously feeds into a loop that can, that can become very unhealthy and you, it's, impossible to to draw healthy boundaries between your yourself and your, and your work so that's a big factor in burnout um but again it's it's there's always a, a flip side because it's qualities like that that make some people incredibly successful and that's what's particularly energizing about their role the fact you know that the fact that they feel so close to identified with it they've kind of got this vivid dream about where they want to take it and what they want what it means in the world um so it's it's I don't want to say balance because that's like such a cliche and it's hard, it's hard to really pin down, but it's, it's when things are, are but when people are burning out, what's generally happened is the psychological contract between them and their work has somehow become unbalanced. Yeah. So say a bit more about that in psychological contract. What, what does that mean? Like, what is it, how does that really show up in somebody's life? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I'm thinking in terms of like what what you want from your from your job um, or your work or whatever it, your your vacation. So you, you kind of have your needs from from it, but then it also has its demands on you as well. Um, and sometimes they work harmoniously, and and sometimes it, it can become very unbalanced on, on one side, and it's eating into other aspects of your life. For example, that would be kind of a simple example uh, would be that if your if your mental mental energy and your actual and your time is getting disproportionately focused on your on your work then you're then you're starting to become over committed over invested and uh, and therefore unbalanced in in other aspects of your life and um one of the ironies of that is that the more over invested and over committed you are the less you actually notice <laughs> that these other aspects of your life are, are sliding, like relationships, health, whatever, fitness, um, other interests. Um, and you kind of notice less and less, and less that your self-concept is getting narrower and narrower, which then makes you quite fragile. Um, and then anything that, that threatens that um, is, is a disaster for you. Yeah, it's... You're a growth hacker and then your company sales start tanking, right? That right. that's that's high risk for your identity. Mm-hmm. Um, not just your career. Um, yeah. And that can be really painful for people. What about solutions? What what have you seen in terms of steps people can take 
first to just get space to think about this and then two longer term uh, solutions you've seen? Yeah. Um, I mean, there's a few, there's a few things that people can do. I mean, my solution is, is basically this, the three principles to it. Um, the first would be to, to actually get to the root as we were discussing. I think that's absolutely uh, foundational uh, to, to having a, a lasting, healthy relationship with the work. Um, secondly, I would say you need to spend some time understanding like the, the mind body loop and connection and really going back to basics there. So getting your sleep right, um, doing some sort of movement or exercise and being more uh, intentional with, with your attention. Um, I mean, meditation works really well for some people. Um, other people, they don't want to, they don't want to do that or they don't want to call it that, but being purposeful about, about where you're pointing your attention is, is I would say an essential step um, to recovery um, and then the third principle I would say would be designing a new approach to your psychological contract with, with your work um, and your building your strengths and your values into your day. Um, but really design, like as in go back to first principles, think about what you actually want to want to get out of out of your day, out of your work life and, and go from, from there, which is why the getting to the root is so essential and you can't really skip that step. I would point people in the direction of, um, I, I think we've spoken before about Dr. Jerry Paleo's work. She does a lot of work on people on how to recover from burnout. And yeah. she almost teach, treats it as like a traumatic event. Like it, it's almost, it's very similar to recovering from PTSD. Um, and one of the things that she notices is that almost everyone who's been burnt out, they actually need to take themselves out of the industry, either... Right you know, either temporarily or, or permanently, they do need a complete break with the thing that has traumatized them um, before they can, you know, start to engage with, with recovery. Um, and the things she, she uh, finds work well in recovery are similar to what we talked about, really, like things like um, uh, exercise, um, reflection, uh, moving, into new, moving into a new industry, taking on a new challenge things like that. But I mean, the, what I would say to anyone who's kind of going through it is there definitely is hope. Um, you know, it, people do recover for, from burnout, um, maybe not as quickly as you might hope, um, but it's not a quick process to become burned out. So the road back is also takes a while, um, but it's, it's not a character flaw. It shows you're human. Um, and I think that just recognizing that you're suffering like this shows that you're human and recognizing that you're human shows you've got huge potential for, you know, for all, for the other side of it, which is joy, connection, thriving, peace. You know, there's, there's a lot to be experienced and it's, it's worth, it's worth it basically is what I'm saying. Yeah. My research on this has led me down a path of realizing, okay, maybe this is a traumatic event. It's kind of a loss of part of who you are and mm -hmm. something that matters to you. But on the other side of that can also be something called post-traumatic growth. And yes. when I started reading the definition of this, I'll, I'll read a little bit of it. It's saying it manifests with appreciation for life in general, more meaningful interpersonal relationships, increased sense of personal strength, change priorities, and a richer existential and spiritual life. Mm -hmm. Now, if most people would sign up for that, <laughs> exactly um but it's it's wild because i did experience a lot of these things and mm -hmm. i think i've talked to many people either have become self-employed or take, taken different paths and they've gone through a really a crisis or something either a work crisis health crisis relationship crisis and almost nobody ever wants to undo what happened to them it's fascinating um yeah. But I also am not sure that you want to induce crises purposely. No. Either. Exactly. Um, so it's kind of one of these challenges of life where it's like the you can find meaning in life through pain. Um, mm. But when you're in the pain, you don't want to be there. Of course. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, the description you read out then is, is very similar to what people describe when they've had like um you know a, a brush with terminal illness or, or you know even uh, or something something or a near-death experience in an accident or something like that that um that 
after the event that the clarity and the focus and the falling away of things that don't matter and the revealing of things that really do matter. Um, but it's like you say, is it the challenge then is to get to that point without putting yourself through a near death experience um, or, or through a crisis. It, it may be that there's, you know, there's maybe not a shortcut to it, but I think if there is, it's probably found through introspection and, and we can support each other in doing that. I mean, I think like you say, you can be more, encouraging of conversations where you ask yeah. people what, you know why they're doing what they're doing are they really happy with it um you know in a non-annoying way you can, <laughs> you can probe and support yeah I, I try not to uh i try not to have those questions those uh conversations too broadly a lot of people just don't really want to have them um mm. but i i basically solve for that by saying every wednesday you can book a call with me and we can chat about work. And that's been one of the most interesting ways where I kind of learn about how people are dealing with these things. Yeah. One, so a couple of the steps are great, right? It's like get to the root cause and figure out the mind-body connection, handle your sleep, maybe start meditating, maybe exercise and move. Mm -hmm. But from what I've seen, like, meditating five minutes a day and moving a little more and um, doing reflection is not going to help the extremely burned out. Uh, is that a different case for you? Is that kind of like a get the get space, get distance as soon as possible type thing? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I'm sort of thinking more of kind of healthy habits that people can, can incorporate, you know, yeah, proactively, exactly. Just kind of being conscious of the fact that you are in a mind body loop all the time for example, is a, is quite a healthy way to, to engage with, with your day. Um, but for people who are actually burned out and unmistakably burned out, um, then a complete break is generally the only way to do it. You, it once you, when you're actually in your, in your role, in your, in your job, it's very, very difficult to pedal that back um, when you're in a state of burnout. And I think that's one of the reasons why company, I mean, you might have a point of view on this as well, but it's why company efforts to tackle burnout generally yeah. miss the mark um because people are already <laughs> in to say the least <laughs> they're already in the, in the environment that's yeah. you know, traumatized them often um with the relationships still as they were um and it's it it actually an, annoys people sometimes like when there's these kind of company burnout programs because it's I think it can feel to people like if you think about if you were in a relationship with a person who, you know, was constantly demanding of you, they didn't let you sleep, they undermined your other relationships, they kind of put you down all the time. And then one day they turn around to you and said, you look a bit stressed, I'm going to leave some healthy snacks out for you. You'd be furious. You'd like, <laughs> you know, it's almost like gas. It's like, so like, true. Oh, That's exactly oh. what businesses do. <laughs> so, yeah. I've my last company, it was doing a wellness initiative. Um, and the wellness initiative meant they would pay for yoga classes at, at like 6.30 after work, right? right. Um, <laughs> and like company events you like had to go to. And it's mm -hmm. like, <laughs> this is not helping. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it's interesting. I, the thing that's intrigued me the most is we're so deeply tied to the idea that we're supposed to work 48 to 50 weeks a year, five days a week. Yeah. Um, that the most obvious thing is just to give people more time or to work less. I think one mm -hmm. of the best ways I've seen people recover from burnout quickly is taking a sabbatical. Yeah. Um, and I've seen people make massive transformations in two months. Right. Yeah. And I mean, our, our mutual friend that we chatted about earlier, that's that's what he did. I mean, it, and one of the things he commented was that um, people were saying to him, oh, you know, give yourself time. Give, it's going to take a while because it took you so long to get burned out. But actually, he was feeling good in a couple of months um, because he had that complete break, that that time to himself, doing things he enjoyed. Um, and yeah, I mean, you you can certainly recover quickly. Yeah, it's even small, small things. Like I was talking to uh, a friend of the podcast that 
took a two month sabbatical and basically realized he was just saying yes to everything at work. Right. <laughs> and it was like, mm-hmm. I should just not do that. <laughs> mm-hmm. Went back to his full time job and is really mm-hmm. enjoying it. Mm-hmm. And Amazing. it was like super small and mm-hmm. like just a small amount of giving, getting a little ownership over your work, I think is one of the biggest benefits of getting that yeah. space or reflection. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because we're brought up with work beliefs and success beliefs that are almost guaranteed to drive you to burnout, right? Work mm-hmm. hard. Make sure you're always showing up early. Do what your boss says. Make your boss look mm-hmm. good. Um, <laughs> like always say yes. It's like, okay, yeah. this might work to get you promoted, but you might be promoted to a job you don't actually want. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's such, that's such a good point. And what comes along with that is is that sort of resentment towards yourself as well as towards your job. Because you, I mean, like like the chap you mentioned, like when you're saying yes to everything, but internally saying no to a lot of it, you know, like on some level, you know, you're not being, you're not treating yourself well. And then there's that kind of, that's almost like a shame comes with that and a, an anger at yourself. Um which is really difficult. And as you say, it comes, it comes from those, those core beliefs that we start off with, that that's what you do and that's what makes you good and valuable. And um, that's what, that's what you do to succeed at work without pausing to actually think, are these good beliefs? So that it's actually going to take me (laughs) somewhere good. Yeah. I, I had built my identity around this person that was one, like really smart at like landing good jobs um, a good consultant and also somebody that like had ownership of my career. So like I would change jobs every like 18 to 24 months, like in my head, like I was never the sucker. Like I would always get out and like make my situation better. And like, I was actively carving it. Um, but now looking back for 10 years, I was basically just ignoring the fact that I was on a path that wasn't mine and it was too scary to admit. Mm-hmm. Um, and it took 10 years mm-hmm. and I still wonder sometimes, am I stupid for walking away? Um, but yeah, it, these things are just so hard. Yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of momentum behind them and a lot of, um, you know, it takes a lot of resistance to, to carve out a different path. I mean, certainly like, like we started the conversation with saying once you're, you know, if you're on those rails and you seem to be doing well, no one's going to, no one's going to stop you. No one's ever going to tell you to work less. No one's ever going to tell you to try something different. Um, you were on the James Alt Altu. I don't know how to say his name. James Altucher uh, yeah. podcast, and mm. he was feeling a moment of burnout. I I actually highly mm. recommend this episode because it was a fascinating combo because he was well, we very much giving each other therapy for a while. <laughs> Well, he was very much in it. He, he one, didn't have a mental model of understanding what was happening to him. Uh, two, was incredibly curious just to like try and figure out. And um, three, he was just really confused about what was going on. Um, but I think it was so like new for him because he, yeah. you know, he's obviously been someone who's always been very productive, like hyper productive. He did stuff he loved, right? Mm. Exactly. Like, you know, his whole career has been very self-directed, just kind of following his passions and his curiosity, never had any issues with productivity. If anything, you know, his pro- productivity was um, hyper. Like he, he, and, and then he'd, he'd hit this, just hit this wall. Um, uh, for, for anyone who, did, you know, who didn't hear the, hear the show, I mean, what happened is he'd had this nasty shock in terms of a bad public reaction to it, to a, article that he'd written at the start of the pandemic um and you know it ended up in a lot of online criticism and kind of personal quite personal criticism and I as we kind of covered in the conversation it was just this huge shock you know he felt that it was unjustified first of all so it was very hurtful in that sense because it was so personal but that that pain had then paralyzed him so that he actually wasn't able to engage with any any of the things that he previously enjoyed, like his work, his writing, 
he was really struggling to do more than a couple of hours a day. Um, he said that he'd um, just taken refuge in doing online chess um, like for hours and hours and hours a day. Um, and it was, it, I think he was healing. Like, you know, we talked yeah. earlier about the sort of recovery from trauma. I think that was probably what was going on. He was just following his um, his impulse to do something that would heal his his brain and his psychology from this nasty shock that obviously also happened at a very uncertain stressful time anyway for the you know for the world um in the middle of lockdown to kind of suddenly be hit with this wave of unjust criticism um yeah and, and he was just I, I think just kind of going through that healing process in and because of the way he works because he's so open and vulnerable he was just working through his questions and his recovery in a very public way yeah the i think the pandemic was incredibly hard for a lot of people i talked to i think a hundred people in 2020 and one of the hardest things was that people were stuck literally in place i think one of the biggest one of the easiest things people can do when they're just feeling disconnected is change location like travel Mm -hmm. extend Mm -hmm. the longer the travel and the less of a vacation it feels like i think is better but Mm -hmm. uh yeah people didn't have that outlet have you seen um what have you seen in 2020 and what are some of the things maybe about travel that you've seen related to burnout that's really interesting yeah i mean the that certainly is, is is something that's come up the fact that people feel very trapped um and that is a big factor in burnout actually um that feeling of you can't physically remove yourself from the stressful situation and the and the hopelessness and the horror and the pain that comes with that it's like it's one of the comments that's come out is when we're working from home we're actually living at work um Mm, and if your work is yeah exactly (laughs) and if your work's burning you out and you're there 24 7 obviously and there's zero delineation between your home space and your workspace um and if you, you take the take the metaphor further that the you know that the work is your stalker or your or the, certainly the object that's traumatizing you then obviously that's been incredibly hard um, and psychologically destructive for, for people and, and added to that the fact that people actually have been objectively working much longer hours. Um, you know, the, the fact that they've saved on the commute time, that's just spilled over into checking emails and being at the laptop um, much, much longer, longer hours. Yeah, well, it also just takes away that disconnect that I think a lot of people did uh, find useful. When you are in an office, like we said at the beginning, it, it is easier to do that work that you aren't as motivated to do because it's like, well, I'm in the office anyway. I exactly, here. Yeah, uh, I'm in work mode. Home. Mm. Here at home, you're like, I mean, I'm sure you've discovered this while being self-employed. Mm. You literally can't do something you're five out of 10 excited about. <laughs> That's so it just, true. It just yeah. doesn't happen. <laughs> you're going to do mm. stuff over here. You're going to do stuff mm. over here. Um, yeah. Just impossible to do. So I think so many realizations for people. And I think it's only the early stages of seeing how that plays out in the job market um, Mm -hmm. everywhere. But I think it's going to have a profound effect in terms of how people relate to their work. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think as well, the other thing is, it's quite hard to be precise about, but when there's been this crisis going on in the world, I think that's really brought into quite sharp relief. If people are feeling fundamentally that their job is is meaningless or not right. beneficial it, it's only amplified that I mean I don't know if if anyone's ever had the experience of like where you've had to come into work where say a family member seriously ill or something like that and there's just that feeling of I have not got time for this petty BS I just I'm just not interested I've got other things on my mind and I think there's almost been like a collective experience of that because of all the stress and anxiety even if you even if you've been fortunate enough not to be personally um, you know anyone ill in your family with 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 COVID I think just the sense of all these things going on in the world and all the pain and suffering our tolerance levels for stuff we don't care about has dropped through the floor yeah and you have the dynamic where the people who are 
future burnout victims. Uh, mm -hmm. They're the ones that are promoted because they have identified so deeply with their work. Yes, um, that's so true. Yeah. And take it so seriously. So even if you're trying to lean against that and build in balance and good habits, you're dealing with a boss that it's life or death if yeah. the work is good. Um, yes. And that can be incredibly hard. Mm. Absolutely. And it, that's one of the things I've actually come across a lot in my work is that, you know, how the leader of the team is, is, is just guaranteed to, to amplify and feed through to the, to the rest of the team. Um, and that's how, how you can end up with such toxic work cultures in, you know, for example, in startups where the founder does have such an outsized influence on how the, on how the, the work's organized, the, the whole ethos, how people, how people relate to each other and so on. Um, you know, so if they are burning themselves out and are, and are identifying with their work, over identifying with with their work, that's inevitably going to feed feed into the team. Yeah the the thing I realized after a while was that the organization was going to shape me more than I was going to ever be myself at work. Right. And I, I think this is a hard realization for people. And we have these idealistic visions of, oh, I'm this like, I'm so good at X. I have this mission. I'm going to make all this change. But at the end of the day, if you're at an organization which incentivizes behavior, which is totally opposite of how you want to be, mm -hmm. you, you're screwed. <laughs> You you gotta get you gotta get out of there and um, find a place that might actually uh, help you be the person you want to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I mean, like you know, that that's one of the reasons why knowing yourself is so essential because um, you're never going to overcome the company incentives. That's you know that's the purpose of incentives is is to is to drive behavior. So if you and if you don't know what your values and your purpose really is you're, you're just going to be swept along by that and find yourself somewhere you really didn't want to be um so again that's why that reflection is so key yeah and I, I think it's hard i i found this remarkably candid interview from 1989 jack welch the ceo of uh, ge and he he's talking about this rollout of this continuous improvement program how he wants all 300,000 employees to follow it um, but he says this crazy thing, like no CEO would talk like this, but he said the psychological contract has to change. He's saying today's workforce, today today's workers expect companies to be loyal. This kind of loyalty tends to focus people inward, but given today's environment, people's emotional energy must be focused outward. It's like, I was like blown away when I read this first, like nobody would say this, but two, there was an explicit aim to say, okay, people feeling secure such that they could focus inward, that has to change. Yeah. Um, we need to get people focusing outward, competing. Um, yeah. And I do sense we're in this 30 year period where we just went super hard into that mode. Mm -hmm. And 2020 really woke people up to that. And it's really leaning back in and saying, Okay, what? Where is the beauty in the world? What are the things worth yeah. contemplating? What uh, what matters to me? And uh, I think that's mm -hmm. the great thing about the kind of work you're doing. Mm. Yeah, that's so interesting. I hadn't heard that quote by Jack Welch before, but that's incredibly revealing um, about what it would be like to be a human in the organization. Um, yeah, gosh. I started. I started my career at GE. So oh, wow. maybe there's mm -hmm. some links there. Yeah, possibly. <laughs> oh, God. Mm -hmm. uh, anything else you're thinking about now as we kind of recover from the pandemic and people's relationship with work and burnout? Uh, what are some of the things that are top of mind for you? Um, yeah, I mean, certainly coming back after the pandemic, there's there's a big hope that a lot of people are saying you know that they don't want to go just go back to how things were before they do want to be more consciously connected to each other and and to their work and be more mindful about the you know their, their work environment and setting and so on but I'm also conscious that there's huge forces partly of habit but also partly because some people are incentivized for things to go back to the way they were 
Um, so I think we're at this quite interesting point where we're going to see which which of those two impulses is actually stronger. Um, because it was, you know, it was obviously a huge momentous time, but really it's only 18 months or so in the in the context of a huge wave of kind of anti-human forces of sort of disconnection and um competition and um, unhealthy work workplaces like as in the physic just the way that we physically work is quite unhealthy with the constant distractions and and the environments and so on so I think that that battle is kind of only just starting and the challenges for those of us who who do want to see a, a different sort of psychological contract but also a different way of engaging with with work and with other people the challenges for us to kind of start offering practical practical solutions and not just kind of talking about it but actually showing ways that people can work in that way um and sort of just working with organizations who are open to it and to yeah. design things and show that it actually can work that there is an alternative available are you are you doing anything interesting with the organizations now yeah so i mean i've got a couple of of, of organizational clients who are actively trying to build in um build in this kind of awareness of burnout into their into their work culture so that then it's so that it's not just this reactive work people until they burn out and then replace them because the sad truth is there are a lot of organizations where that model actually works for them you know to just yeah. burn people out boot them out and replace them there's very little cost to them to, to doing that um so I'm, I'm working with a couple of organizations who want to to try a different model of of working working with people and that's um you know, and it's not just kind of bottles of um, juice and uh, granola on the side. Like actually um, setting up the setting up the work day and the work relationship to uh, be more human friendly. Um, are and that, they and open? That, are they open to things like four day weeks and extended breaks uh-huh. for people though? Yes, yeah, some some are, um, some aren't, some aren't. I mean, the, one quite interesting company that you, you might have seen in the news last week is, you know, Bumble had the, they gave their workforce a week off for specifically for burnout. Um, so, I mean, there are some companies that are willing to experiment um, and lead the way and differentiate themselves in that way. Um, and it's quite interesting, actually, if you look at, at, the, at the public response, I think people now are a bit more tuned into authenticity as a value like it's just not enough to say you know to to just say for example we support these values people actually do want to see some action um by the companies even if it's at the you know at the cost to their bottom line i think people are valuing now that sort of differentiation through authenticity fantastic yeah i mean they're out there but you know it's it's a challenge but um (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah. There are some people who want to take it on. Yeah, I'm the, I'm the dreamer. That's why I call this podcast mm-hmm. Reimagine Work. Uh, I mm-hmm. talked to Sean McCabe uh, a couple of weeks ago and his company, a small company, they take every mm-hmm. seven weeks off. Wow, okay. um, and his mm-hmm. mission by 2047 is to get every company in the world to do this. I, lo- I love the boldness of this, but I also mm. think there's some wisdom there just in terms of giving people space to do the deep creative work that we claim we want to be doing at work anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's interesting. Yeah. And mm. I appreciate all the work you're doing to uh, at least wake up uh, these organizations to the right questions, because I think mm. you're uh, you're super thoughtful about this. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Awesome. Well, it was good talking to you today, Natalie, and uh, keep up the good work. <laughs> Thank you very much, and you. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, anywhere you want to point people, I think no more burnout. No more burnout. Yep, you can you can get in touch through there, um, or as you know, I'm on Twitter. Um, that's at Natalie Rach. It's is my handle.